Good evening, dear all. English Without Borders is happy to welcome all of you uh, for its Thursday series of English Without Borders webinars. And we welcome all of you to our session today. And uh, today uh, it, it is uh, with a great pleasure uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm introducing our guest speaker today. Uh, we are happy to host Dr. Marsha Herlow, who will talk about poetry in the English learner classroom. And let me give some brief introduction of our uh, speaker today. Uh, Dr. Marsha L. Herlow retired as a professor from Osbury University in 2018. She was director of both the creative writing program and the master's in teaching English to speakers of other languages. Her poetry, fiction, and creative nonfiction have appeared in literary magazines across the USA, Canada, and Britain. Her six books of poetry include Enemy, Word Tech, Alliance Are Intercepting My Brain Base, Sade Street Press, Dangers of Travel, Riverstone Press, A Tree Ogham, Nova Press, Green Man uh, in Suburbia, Backward City Press. Uh, brush strokes on water finishing line press and she's also a co-editor of Kansas City Voices and with great pleasure I'm giving the floor uh, to Dr. Marsha Hollow. Uh, dear audience please uh, attend this webinar and also leave your questions in the chat box uh, get engaged uh, because uh, Dr. Marsha Hollow will talk will talk about how to involve uh, poetry in English learner classroom. Thank you so much. Uh, and over to you, Dr. Marsha. Thank you, Nashiba. I'm so, so excited about uh, getting to talk with you uh, about poetry in the English language classroom. Uh, I know that some of you are already doing this. Some of you, as, as Nashiba sh shared uh, earlier, are writing your own poetry and what a great model for your students. Uh, thanks so much. Um, we, we know that uh, communicative competence is really our aim for, uh, for language learning, for language teaching. Uh, and, but usually we think of communicative competence in terms of transactions. These uh, transactional functions, uh, such as buying groceries, giving instructions, following directions, and we we want that for our students, but all of that competence depends also on many other things, such as uh, cultural and affective functions. Uh, buying groceries may involve developing relationships. Uh, with the butcher, with the produce manager. Um, uh, it may involve expressing appreciation for their help. Um, so most transactional uses of language involve uh, multiple cultural, affective, and expressive acts. Uh, so Teaching the poetry of a language can help your students with all of those uh, language functions. Take a look at some of these um, uh, briefly. I know that uh, even though my teachers, are, I'm almost 70, so most of my teachers of foreign languages uh, actually um, we're uh, using grammar translation methods or uh, audiolingual methods, but they still use poetry in the classroom. If you take a look at the next slide. Thanks. Um, we, can, we can see that uh, memorizing poems uh, and other uh, original texts in English can be very useful for students. Um, my Latin teacher had us uh, memorize passages from Caesar. I can still do the, the uh, little bits of, of that. Our, my French teacher had us memorize little flirty uh, 
passages from the textbook. And uh, my German teacher had us memorize uh, poems from Goethe and Heine um, that still stick with me. So uh, uh, why do we uh, teach poetry in the second language classroom? And I have to turn to the next slide. Uh, there's beauty, affective, our affective tie to the language can be very important in learning a language. Um, our willingness to learn a language is to, do, to a degree influenced by our affective view of the culture and the values who speak it. Um, poetry elevates the musical qualities of a language. And you don't need to know the translation to recognize the beauty of a poem. Um, I remember so well, uh, we had met with a group of uh, Taj Tajik scholars uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, one recited a ghazal, uh, a ghazal. Uh, and the beauty of the language and its forms, its couplets and rhyme scheme were recognizable and rich. And I already loved the, the people I had met uh, from Tajikistan, but that poem he recited really made me want to understand the language and learn the language. Uh, the cultural knowledge that it brings along is also very important. Um, one of my teachers, the poet Patty Ann Rogers uh, told us, Every good poem teaches me something. Now, Patty Ann had in mind um, a lot of scientific facts. A lot of her poems have a lot of science in them. She's married to um, a professor of, of uh, science, and I'm forgetting whether it's biology or physics, uh, but um, her poems are very rich in, in that. And I, uh, I think especially what, uh, a poem that you might be interested in using, uh, especially when you teach about environmental concerns is one of her poems called Geocentric. And it's from her book of the same name, Geocentric. Um, I've included a more contemporary poem by her, recent poem by her in the uh, handout. You'll see it the, on, I think um, you, you you're gonna post that you mentioned to your Facebook page. Am I right, Nashiva? That you'll post that, great. Um, but also take a look at some of her earlier poems uh, for environmental studies. Um, so the, in, uh, the English teacher can use poetry to teach facts when teaching, poem, uh, teaching students about a particular subject. Um, uh, you can find a poem about anything and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Enunciation also is uh, something that you can teach um, when uh, teaching poems in the English classroom. Uh, my German teacher especially had us ham it up, uh, really uh, do dramatic readings when we recited the poems that we had memorized. Uh, to give us that kind of freedom of pronunciation and also to teach us about um, the rhythms of the language. Um, uh, when I first started teaching English uh, to, uh, to English language learners, I used a program called Jazz Chants, which uh, focused a lot on the rhythm and pronunciation but you can do the same kind of things with teaching poetry. Uh, one very short poem that I've used with 
uh, early English language learners is a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks called We Real Cool. Gwendolyn Brooks is um, a uh, African American poet from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, uh, I'm originally from Ohio, so I have a special affection for Gwen Gwendolyn Brooks poetry. I'll recite uh, her poem, We Real Cool, which you have up on the on the uh, slide. We real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. So it brings up a lot of the 1960s kinds of knowledge that she has. Um, about the culture it, uh, she comes from, uh, as well as giving us the rhythm of her speech. There are many recordings of her reading this poem, which are, of course, more <laughs> interesting, I would think, than having me read it. Another one of my favorites for rhythm and stress is a poem called I Knew a Woman by Theodore Rutke. Um, his uh, uh, poem, poems really bring out the quality of his English at the time. And I've included a, a poem by him uh, on the handout uh, next. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. Um, and uh, I'll let you Take a look at that poem on your Nein, man zumba kosh avan kosh kade te hi joshu na chudos. Okay. Uh take a look at that uh poem later. It made me want someone to write a poem like that about me. Um another thing about pronunciation that you can use poetry for uh, is to clarify that there are many uh, irregularities in English spelling. You wanna to go to the next slide? Uh, a poem uh, that you'll also find on the uh, handout is Design by Robert Frost. Uh, teachers have often used uh, poems with exact rhymes to teach the sounds associated with our very irregular uh, spelling in the English. Uh, for example, a poet might use the end rhymes of sky and sigh. Well, sky is spelled S-K-Y and sigh is spelled S-I-G-H. But if the, the student knows that there is a rhyme expected on those lines, um, they can uh, recognize this, the sound even though they may uh, see that the spelling is different. Uh, we can rely on uh, poems written through the 1960s, um, uh, such as Design by Robert Frost. And Robert Lowell is another good example of a fairly modern poet who uses exact rhymes in his sonnets and other formal poetry. Let me read for you the poem Design by Robert Frost. Um, Robert Frost is a well-known poet. Uh, every every uh, American uh, going through high school learns his his poetry. Um, Robert Frost was one of the first poets to be asked to uh, uh, recite a poem at a presidential inauguration. Uh, Robert Frost read uh, a poem for uh, JFK uh, Kennedy's President Kennedy's inauguration. So design by Robert Frost. 
I found a dimpled spider, fast, fat and white, on a white heel all, holding up a moth like a white piece of rigid satin cloth. Assorted characters of death and blight mixed ready to begin the morning rite. Like the ingredients of a witch's broth, a snowdrop spider, a flower like a froth, and dead wings carried like a paper kite. What had that flower to do with being white, the wayside blue and innocent heel all? What brought the kindred spider to that height and steered the white moth thither in the night? But what design of darkness to appall if design govern in things so small? So if you know the poem, you know that uh, frost rhymes uh, words like white and blight, but white and blight are spelled very differently. We expect that rhyme in a sonnet like design. Uh, and so a, a student can count on those poem, those lines rhyming, even though the, the words are spelled very differently. Uh, notice white, height, night, kite, um, all of these uh, rhymes in this poem, but not spelled with the same end, end letters. Uh, I also include one of my poems. Uh, if you go to the next, next slide. It's a, a poem written in traditional sonnet structure, like Frost's poem. Uh, but it uses half rhymes and slant rhymes. It would probably not be a good poem uh, for you to use um, because contemporary poets uh, try to not rhyme exactly um, because they don't want that clang that's created by exact rhymes. Uh, note it, uh, let me read that poem for you and then I'll talk a little bit about it. It's included on the handout. It's titled Nuclear Romance. You know that our systems spiral down to atoms, mirrors of cosmic shapes awaken the coffee, the small prick of blood, the air rushing down before the cold rain. Know too that those atoms spiral up, the cyclotron magnetically clocking speeds our spaceships will never manage. Those particles spin within your hand, your lips on mine in a faster dance than the dizziest turn will ever step. Stop then, love. What more would you do for me than the whole universe whirling between us? the infinitesimal revolutions that accelerate in your slowest caress. Now you might hear some, hear some rhymes, hear some musical qualities at the end of those lines, but they are not exact rhymes. Um, so for example, down and rain, uh, they both end with the N sound, but they don't have the same vowel. So that would not be considered an exact rhyme. Uh, notice us and caress are rhymed, but again, not the same exact rhyme. Uh, so be careful <laughs> if you're going to use um, poems to talk about uh, different irregular spellings and rhymes. Try not to use a contemporary poet uh, unless you're pretty sure uh, that they're an exact rhymer. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, poetry is wonderful in introducing topics. 
uh, because everything is a poem. I say this to my students again and again, my creative writing students, everything is a poem. You can write a poem about anything. And that's great for us as English teachers because if you want a poem about a particular topic, say you're introducing scientific terms, you can go to uh, poems by people like Patty Ann Rogers. If you're looking for nature poems, uh, you can go to uh, uh, Robert Frost and uh, many, many poets right now are writing about uh, nature and environmental concerns. Um, any any uh, topic could be introduced with poetry. I, I'm sorry, my daughter left. <laughs> she uh, teaches French uh, in a local high school and she uses poetry to encourage her students to look for cognates, uh, letting students first enjoy the poem. She might uh, find a video in which a poem is uh, set to music or there's a, a, a video background that would interest them. And then she talks about the subject of the poem and makes notes about um, the language that they use in talking about the subject. And then she goes on um, to look at possible cognates uh, in the poem with uh, words that they know. Now, my daughter uh, has uh, students that almost all, all of them speak an Indo-European language as their first language. She does have um, uh, some Korean and Vietnamese and uh, uh, Thai speakers. So it's finding cognates with their first language is not gonna be uh, too possible. But uh, uh, for those of you who, who do speak English uh, to speakers of Indo other Indo-European languages, um, this finding of cognates can, can work very well. Uh, if you take a look at, uh, of course she has to teach about false cognates. The slide reminded me. Uh, there are plenty of false cognates that we have to be alert for. Um, I've included uh, some sources for poetry videos uh, on the on the uh, handout that you you'll see on uh, Facebook. Uh, one of the best resources is uh, uh, poets.org, and uh, uh, it's just an endless resource but so of course you can just google a lot of uh a, a lot of famous poems and the authors reading them all right um let me see if there are uh, any questions so far before i move on let me see Oh, hello from uh, Brazil. Hello, hello. Okay. Uh, let's see. Are we still getting tick, tick, tick on my on my mic? Is anyone? No, no noises okay. right now. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, let's see. Fernando asks, uh, uh, what's the biggest challenge that teachers face when using poetry in the classroom? Uh, sometimes uh, uh, Americans, people raised in the, the American system have some negative feelings about poetry in general, or uh, they've felt intimidated 
about poetry. So um, I've found that one of my first, first tasks is to make them feel comfortable with poetry, to understand that poetry um, is something part of their daily, uh, daily life. Um, it's not a riddle that they have to figure out. Uh, it's just making beauty, uh, putting together the beauty of their experience, um, encouraging them to to see the the world around them fresh. So I think uh, I don't know, Fernando, if that addresses your your question. Okay. Um, any other questions before we talk a little bit about writing poetry? Okay. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Um, let's let's move to the next slide then. Okay. Um, so the the question comes up. Uh, when we talk about having students write their own uh, poem, why are we doing this? Why are we asking somebody who wants to learn um, English for business purposes or um, they're, they're going to be a computer expert or in, in an English speaking country and so forth? Why, why is it important for them to write their own poems in English. Well, it's part of learning the expressive function of the language. Um, learning to write a poem in English gives the students an opportunity to exercise this function in their target language. Uh, they're still going to be interacting with other human beings. Um, to have an emotional outlet, to have uh, a, a sense of appreciation that they can express in the new language uh, is important. Uh, it increases their sense of ownership of the target language. Uh, if they can um, express their personal feelings uh, in English, they are owning English in a new and positive way. And of course, as we've said, uh, it increases the positive uh, affective relationship to English. I think, uh, um, oh, that's a good point. Um, uh, Nadia mentions, as a rule, boys don't like poetry as much as girls do. And yet, some of our most famous poets uh, are, are men. And that's uh, possibly a good reason to include male poets as your, uh, in your uh, modeling and subjects that those boys would be interested in. There are a lot of uh, uh, poems about sports, there's a whole magazine in English dedicated to baseball poetry, if you can imagine. Um, I, just about any subject that the boys in your class might be interested in, you can find poems that will be about those subjects and giving them permission to write about uh, the things they're interested in, whether that's soccer or um, climbing trees or what, whatever, depending on their age. Um, there are uh, poems about space, about space travel, about um, raising, raising animals, you name it. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, really, the the um, uh, the key with boys is to find the subject matter, and then that they're interested, in, and then 
give them poems about that subject matter. Um, the kind of activities I use uh, to boost my students' interest in creating poems is using poetry throughout, making it a normal part uh, of our class, but also uh, to find poems with subject matter that interests them. Uh, I sometimes have used the lyrics of uh, popular songs uh, to talk about poetry. Um, uh, some of our uh, popular musicians actually use poetry as their lyrics. Um, if you look at, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the musician Sting. He was um, a musician, uh, a popular musician. It was originally with uh, the British group, uh, The Police. Uh, he has used uh, a lot of Shakespeare's po uh, poems and other uh, poetry uh, as the lyrics of his uh, songs. Um, what are some elements we should take into consideration when using poetry in the classroom? Um, I, sh I would uh, uh, be sure that when you ask students to start uh, writing poems, um, that they're prepared for that. Um, I don't ask um, English language learners uh, to start writing poems um, until they have certain abilities so they don't get frustrated. And I think, um, Fernando, that's a, a good question uh, to ask. And we might um, take a look at the next, next slide, please. Um, it's kind of difficult since we're using different, different scales and working with different groups of students uh, to say, oh yeah, they should be intermediate level or they should have a TOEFL of a certain level or you know, where, uh, how you judge by, by uh, standard scoring, whether they're ready to uh, start writing their own poetry. Um, well, there are some basic things though that you can judge as, a, as an English teacher to see if they're ready. Um, you would want them to be familiar with present, past, and future verb tenses so they can move around in their poems. Uh, uh, they can um, talk about things that they aim for or something that happened in the past uh, as we'll be doing with a, a model. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see if we can go to the previous slide, please. The student, uh, the uh, slide before this one. Yeah. Um, I look for them to have uh, certain categories of uh, vocabulary. Uh, for example, um, common things that they want to write about uh, their family or nature or home, their home setting. Uh, and they should be able to talk about what they want or observe. So in terms of um, vocabulary, vocabulary they uh, can use for um, moving uh, around, right, in, a, in, a, in the uh, subject matter, we want that. And Fernando, you're exactly right. We, you need some links. And those will be in the, um, uh, the handout that you'll get on uh, the um, uh, Facebook. I think they're going to put up the, uh, the handout and with, which will include some more poems for you to use as well as some references. 
Okay. Uh, do you want to uh, move to the next slide then? Thank you. Um, when I get started with a group of English language learners on uh, uh, writing poetry, I begin with free verse. And that's a little different than I do with uh, native speakers. Um, with When I'm teaching uh, creative writing classes, beginning poetry classes with native speakers, I start with sonnets and sestinas, villanelles, the formal poetry of the language. Uh, so they focus on uh, the form and don't get intimidated by subject matter. But uh, that's a lot for an English language learner to juggle, uh, to get all of the rhythm and rhymes and forms. Uh, so uh, with English language learners, I begin with free verse. Um, I look for uh, uh, a model that will ask for subject matter they're already familiar with uh, and only need terms that we've used a lot in the classroom or um, memories for the content of the poem. So that's not a challenge. And um, I begin with a model, a model in English but I try not to be too strict about it, to give them room for that expressive function uh, that I was talking about. Uh, the fourth thing to be concerned with is that not everything they want to write about will they have an English translation for. They won't necessarily have an equivalent in English. It may not exist, right? Um, so I let them use the word in uh, their first language, their native language, uh, in that point in the poem. So they can write and write freely. Uh, later, the student and I might discuss a bit about um, what that object or concept is. Uh, is, there, is there anything that might be in English that they're just not familiar with. Uh, but that's not something I worry about on the first draft. And letting um, the students write freely, uh, get it meaning it is really important at that point. Um, and finally, I encourage them to share their poems with one another. And I hope we'll have time uh, to do that uh, before the end of the hour we have together. Um, oh, uh, and a question that sometimes comes up if you, if I'm letting them use the term in their first language, uh, can they write it in a script other than, other than the Roman alphabet? Because I'm encouraging them to know the sounds uh, associated with the Roman alphabet. I encourage them to try to write the term uh, using the Roman alphabet. But if that doesn't work for them, go ahead and write it in some, uh, you know, in the Cyrillic or the Devanagari or whatever uh, script they would normally use for that language. Uh, the, pur the purpose of the first draft is to get that um, language down on the paper so they can play with it. Okay, uh, let's move on then. Uh, if we can look at the next next slide, please. Okay, um, a dear friend of mine, uh, uh, a woman that I was in a writing group for decades uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, George Ella Lyon, has given you permission uh, to use a poem in your classroom titled, Where I'm From. This is a poem that she, she wrote many years ago and is very popular uh, as, a, as a point um, 
for a uh, starting point for writing, having students write their first poems in English. Um, but she's given you permission to use it uh, yourselves, uh, even though she's uh, a contemporary poet. And this is this is the poem that she she gives to you with her blessings. Um, Georgia Ella uh, was uh, born and raised in a part of Eastern Kentucky that is part of the Appalachian region of the United States. Um, Georgia Ella is now in her 70s, but when she was a child, most of the people in that area were quite poor. Although uh, George Ellis says, we didn't know it. We didn't know we were poor. Uh, the region is very rich in culture and uh, George Ella herself learned to play instruments and sing traditional songs uh, in the area very young. And uh, faith in God and the importance of uh, family and family relationships um, were central to her community. So I'm giving you a little bit about Georgella so you get a feel for the poem. Uh, you can, um, I encourage you to talk a little bit about uh, the authors and, and their settings so they can get, that your students get, can get a sense of the person who uh, the model is coming from. Uh, obviously, uh, they may not know of anything about the Appalachian region of the United States, but you're giving them some cultural knowledge. Um, then I'm going to read the poem for you. There's, there are um, some uh, videos of Georgella reading her poetry on my Facebook page. I'd be glad to have you as my Facebook friend, but um, her videos on my Facebook page, uh, you can use without becoming my friend if you don't want to do that. Um, she reads some of her poems that she's read recently. And Georgella is also now a recent uh, poet laureate of Kentucky. So you'll find other videos of her reading uh, poems on the web. So this is her poem, Where I'm From. I'm, I am from clothespins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I'm from the dirt under the back porch, black, glistening, it tasted like beets. I am from the forsythia bush, the Dutch elm whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I'm from the fudge and eyeglasses, from Imogene and Alifair. I'm from the know-it-alls and the pass-it-ons, from perk up and pipe down. I'm from he restoreth my soul with the cotton ball lamb and 10 verses I can say myself. I'm from Artemis and Billy's branch, fried corn and strong coffee. From the finger my grandfather lost to the auger, the eye my father shut to keep his sight under my bed was a dress box spilling old pictures, a sift of lost faces to drift beneath my dreams. I am from those moments, snapped before I budded, leaf fall from the family tree. All righty. Um, so, I would probably at this point have the students go with me through the poem and possibly ask me about vocabulary that they may not be familiar with. Um, one thing about this poem that characterizes 
uh, good contemporary poetry is it's very specific. It uses specific vocabulary um, to uh, say what you could use a whole, a whole uh, essay about. Let's take a look here. Clothes pins you're probably familiar with. Uh, clothes pins are uh, usually a little wooden uh, springed uh, thing, could be a plastic thing, plastic clip-like thing that we uh, use to hang clothes out to dry after washing them. We put them out on a line um, uh, when, after we wash clothes to let them dry. Um, we don't see this a lot anymore uh, in the United States. Uh, most people just stick them in the clothes dryer, but people who are trying to be more cautious about environmental concerns uh, still hang their wet clothes out to dry on a, on a clothesline using clothes pins. Uh, the terms Clorox and carbon tetrachloride are rich terms for me. Um, uh, if you take a look at uh, these terms, uh, we get uh, a picture of 1950s life. Uh, Clorox and carbon tetrachloride are used in uh, washing clothes. Uh, Clorox is a brand of bleach. Um, people call other kinds of clothes bleach uh, Clorox, even though it's not that brand because it's uh, so iconic. Um, in uh, featuring clothes pins, Clorox, carbon tetrachloride as being so much of her life, um, it uh, says something about the common structure of a 1950s family. Um, usually the mother would be home with the children uh, doing uh, domestic tasks like uh, the laundry uh, while, while the husband would be away uh, at, a, at their work. In this case, uh, in George Ella's family, uh, the husband, her father, would probably be uh, in a coal mine uh, or working in some uh, related position. So Clorox and tetrachloride uh, is practically a whole essay about 1950s uh, family life, but she says it in just those uh, few specific terms. Being specific gives the poem authenticity. We believe, because she can be so specific, that she has had this experience. And it, it enriches our understanding of her life. Uh, by being specific about her memories of childhood in her poems, uh, Georgella invites us in. We might need to look up what carbon tetrachloride is. I did. Uh, I don't think my mother used carbon tetrachloride, uh, but she did use Clorox. Uh, that's fair. We can ask somebody uh, to look up something if they don't uh, know it. Okay, that's totally fair. Uh, what other terms would you like to ask about in this poem? Any other terms? occur to you that you'd like to ask about? Okay, she um, talks about Dutch, a Dutch elm. Uh, that's the kind of 
uh, tree that was very common uh, in the Midwest and South. But unfortunately, when I was very young, there was a tree disease called Dutch elm disease that destroyed a lot of the Dutch elm. And that's why she talks about its long gone limbs. It very much places us. Um, fudge is a kind of sweet, um, still common in the United States. Uh, Imogene and Alifair are, uh, were common women's names in that uh, 1950s period. We don't uh, name a lot of children, Imogene or Alifair. Uh, Know-it-alls, oh, you're a know-it-all, or uh, is, is a, a term that I heard a lot as a kid, pass it on, that is tell somebody else about this. Um, we go down a little further. Uh, he restoreth my soul is a piece of a Bible verse um, uh, common to uh, Christians. And um, he restoreth my soul is also part of a hymn that would, uh, she would have sung in, in church. Uh, Cotton ball lamb is a children's activity in Sunday school at a church. Having kids memorize uh, verses of the Bible would be very common. Uh, she mentions uh, then an Artemis in Billy's Branch, um, specific place names, totally fair. And they may not even be th places you want to look up. You might not even be able to look up. But again, it gives us the flavor of uh, her region. Fried corn and strong coffee um, would be common, a common food. Uh, she talks about her grandfather losing a finger in the auger. An auger would be a kind of saw that they would use uh, on a farm or uh, possibly in his work. Uh, then she talks about having a box that she uh, kept photo photographs of her family that would be, uh, that had passed on uh, under her bed uh, because family, very important. And they would take out pictures uh, of family to, as they talked about their memories of the people. Uh, and then she ends with um, leaf fall from the family tree. All righty, are you ready to do a little writing based on this model? Okay, um, she's set up a form and I, I encourage you to try it just to keep yourself moving. Um, uh, if you had time, I would uh, encourage you to have your students make a list of, uh, of objects and places uh, that were important in their uh, childhood, and then uh, phrases that they remember as being common in their childhood. And then they can fill that into this form. Uh, but we're going to dive right in. Okay. Um, I am from, I am from, I am from is the common refrain through Georgella's um, poem. I am from, meaning this is the place I am from. This is quality of the place I'm from. All right. Um, again, try to, if you know the word in English, please go ahead and uh, fill in that word. If you don't know the word in English, uh, add your own word. Add the word from your own uh, language that you experience this in. Okay. And as I said, if you can you put that in the Roman alphabet, go for it. Okay. Are you ready to try? You ready to try the poem? Okay. Let me give you 
five minutes because I don't want you to get intimidated. I want you to just do a quick first draft. There's no wrong answer. That's another nice thing about poetry. I am from the book. Oh, yeah. Oh, Nashiri, I love this. I am from heaven, which is called seven, where the souls rest and there is a universe. Yes, nice. Okay, um, uh, while you finish your, your poems, your first draft, um, I always, I wanted to mention, I always tell my students that they do not have to share. If I ask them to read uh, a poem they've written in class, it's totally okay to say, I'd, I would rather not, um, uh, especially on, a, uh, on prompts like this, that ask them to reach back into a childhood. We don't know, you know, what kind of emotions those personal memories bring up. So I don't want I don't want them to feel um, they might be embarrassed by being overly emotional. Uh, I try try to respect that for my students. So as much uh, that I try to encourage them to read aloud because I think it's important for them to practice their own language. Um, I don't, I don't require it. I don't, I don't want to stir up something for them that is uncomfortable. Oh, hills in our village that tasted like the sun. Oh, that's lovely. The street that looks like Paris. Abba. Now that's getting specific. I like that. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know, Nasiba, if if you can um, give people permission uh, to read to the rest of us to to unmute their mics if they would be willing. Willing yeah, to yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. That would be great. I mean, because uh, the authors, whenever they read the poems, it, it sounds differently. Oh yes, for sure, definitely. Would it, would anyone um, 
like to read your poem. The, the deal is these are first drafts. I know if I gave you more than five minutes to write it, uh, it would be 10 times as beautiful. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind sharing what you've uh, uh, read so far and uh, Nasiba will unmute your mic so we can hear it in your voice. Anybody be willing to to read? I think Parvina, Parvina, because she started first. Parvina Rizoiva, can you unmute yourself and uh, yeah, read your poem? Oh, thank you, Parvina. Parvina, can you hear us? So, uh, if if you, uh, you have if you experience technical, okay, yes, yes, please unmute yourself. Um, okay, good. Hello, everybody. Hello, dear colleagues. Hello, Miss Marcia and uh, Miss Nasiba and other um, friends. Uh, so, let me read that little piece of um, poetry, okay. <laughs> if it can be called so. I'm from the hills of our village that tasted like the sun, from the first bubble gums that had different flavors. I'm from the past where everybody listened to disco and loved ABBA and modern talking songs. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Oh, and the bubble gum with different flavors. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, I remember the first bubble gum I had with different flavors. That really brings and uh, one thing your your palm does for me um, that I, I didn't mention. Uh, what makes what makes a poem wonderful is to uh, appeal to different senses, and you did that beautifully in that short piece um, with the flavor of gums and the sound of abba and talking. Uh, well done, Parvina. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we have uh, Mr. Fernando, who, who is uh, joining English Without Borders webinars from Brazil. And uh, like we are so, so honored to have him uh, always with us. So, uh, Mr. Fernando, can you unmute yourself and also read your poems? Beautiful poems. Okay. Okay, let, let me let me put on my shirt. Sorry. <laughs> I was here. I didn't expect that. Okay, so let's go. I am from the others, from those who need some love and peace. I am for the others, for those who can bring me some peace in difficult times. I am for and from you all. Oh, lovely. I like how you use the form, Fernando. You, you uh, uh, added your own rhythm uh, <laughs> to that uh, as you take the first couplet and then the second couplet uh, loving others and and they love taking the love that's that's wonderful Hello. hi fernando <laughs> i'm having a great time thank you so much for your wonderful ideas fantastic thank you thanks very much Glad you can participate and thank you again for sharing your, your work i hope you'll continue to work the, uh, add to that. Add Thank to you, ma'am. Anyone else? Anyone else willing to share your poems? Uh, we also have Firuz. Firuz, could you also, yeah, could you please also read your uh, poem? Firuz, are you, are you with us? Yes, I am here with yes. you. Hello, everybody. But uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't hear you well. Yes, I just wrote that uh, I'm from the street. It looks, which uh, looks like Paris, <laughs> that's all. Oh, nice. Well, I'm glad to see your background too. Are you, are you at home or are you uh, in the street of your town? Yes, I'm at home. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. 
Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Well, you're getting a great start, friends, and uh, I'm I'm uh, so happy happy that Nishida can include uh, many more poems that uh, I suggest you read that you might be able to use in your classroom. Um, all of these now. It took a little while for me to get in touch with Georgella because uh, I'm now in Kansas and she's in in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, but she gives you permission and the other poems uh, are old enough that you can uh, use those in your classroom and find many more, right? These, these can be just a beginning for your students um, to enjoy, to appreciate the affective part of communicative competence and enjoy ex uh, taking ownership in a way that you can do um, of a language when you're writing your poetry in the language. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Marsha Holo. You really opened the door to a beautiful land of poetry <laughs> during your webinar, and we all enjoyed, like, you know, uh, listening to your presentation as well as just, you know, uh, also. Uh, you know, uh, enjoying the interpretation that you also just uh, gave through the poem. So it was really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. So um, as a big fan of poetry myself, I, I do, in, I, I usually do enjoy such kind of, you know, um, beautiful um, poems. So thank you very much for sharing the links. Uh, also, also, uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would like to make a suggestion uh, because uh, in Tajikistan, we also have some students and some teachers who like poetry. Maybe if we could organize something like, uh, you know, uh, some teleconferencing or some, you know, some, uh, let's say, um, Central Asia and America emerging poets forum online forum or something like that that would be really great because like you know uh poetry has no boundaries and i i believe that you know all the beauty that unites people through the poems it makes the world uh and also you know uh both teaching learning english much more interesting absolutely and and, and i i wish we had a little more time uh, that i could hear more of your poems Maybe you could. I don't. I don't read Russian, but maybe uh, it, it, your poems in English. If you uh, would be so kind, you, you all to to send me your poems. I'd love to read them. So yes. anyway, I'm afraid. Yes. Yes. I will send them. <laughs> I will send them to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, the uh, uh, Dr. Marshallo, and thank you so much again for our big audience who usually join through the Zoom platform and also who watch us on Facebook. Uh, you really inspire us uh, to move forward, uh, to be creative and you know to create more useful content for you. So thank you so much. Uh, please stay tuned on us. And uh, Dr. Marsha Hollow, we believe that you know this idea will spring, yeah, and bring more, <laughs> more ideas further to join and stay connected. Uh, in the future, uh, and also to enjoy beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful uh, poetry and uh, also like, you know, beautiful uh, creations. So thank you very much, uh, dear all. Have a great evening. Uh, and uh, for you, Dr. Marshall, have a productive day ahead. Thank you. Thank yes. You. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we stay connected. Please, uh, yeah, please take care of yourself and stay well, dear all. Thank you so much for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.